so now we can continue to look at some relaxation phenomena. Now we're going to turn to the problem of describing the relaxation not phenomenologically just by specifying the T1 and T2 values but by specifying the microscopic mechanisms of relaxation. This is a very large and very complicated subject. There are many different relaxation mechanisms. They can all be correlated with each other and I'm only going to describe a relatively simple situation but nevertheless one which is uh, very rich and gives rise to a lot of different interesting NMR phenomena. And this is the situation which is common in NMR in solution where the, the dominant relaxation mechanism is caused by dipole-dipole couplings. In other words, the DD relaxation mechanism. Now the physical basis of this mechanism is is pretty easy to understand, at least qualitatively. If we have a molecule and we have a pair of nuclear spins in it, and each spin acts as a small magnet which generates a magnetic field, which circulates around in the space in the vicinity of this spin. And neighboring spins, such as this one here, will experience a magnetic field from, from the other spin. So there's a term in the spin Hamiltonian um, which represents the coupling between the two nuclear spins through space. So this is also called a through space dipole-dipole inter interaction. Now the magnitude of this interaction is uh, an important quantity. It's called the dipole-dipole coupling constant. which by convention is often denoted by the symbol B, J, K. Probably because D, J, K is reserved for something else. The important thing about it is that it's given by some, some physical uh, constants Uh, there's the magnetic constant, um, which is essentially an artifact of SI units, and which is simply uh, a particular number in SI units. And then we have the two gyromagnetic ratios of the nuclei involved, which are uh, extremely well determined for, for any uh, pair of nuclear species h-bar and other physical constant um, and then the distance between the two nuclei the inverse cubed one over the distance cubed between the nuclei so we have this um, the distance between the, the two uh, nuclei and potentially this is a very powerful relationship because it says that if you can determine the magnitude of a certain NMR parameter, the coupling constant, dipole-dipole coupling constant, then through some very well-known physical parameters you can relate that to the internuclear distance. And, uh, and there are very many um, important NMR methods which are on some level just come down to ways of determining the dipole-dipole coupling constant experimentally and thereby um, deriving the distance between nuclei. And from a lot of distances you can obtain molecular structure. So a lot of solid state NMR methods are based on this principle and also important structure determination methods in solutions such as the Nosy and Rosy experiments come down to ways of determining or estimating this dipole-dipole coupling constant and hence distances. And in solution NMR, the, the route to doing that, or the main route, is to determine this through a relaxation effect. Um, one can't determine the dipole-dipole coupling constants directly in isotropic liquids because the dipole-dipole coupling averages to zero. It doesn't influence the, 
the uh, frequencies of NMR peaks, uh, providing the liquid is isotropic, which it usually is usually the case. But it does come into relaxation properties, and it's those relaxation properties which are um, estimated through experiments such as NOSI. And that's because it basically comes into the relaxation superoperator. Now, the, to write down the relaxation superoperator, so we have the, the superoperator for dipole dipole relaxation. And it's a function of the dipole dipole coupling constant. A quantity which determines how rapidly those couplings uh, fluctuate in time, and then a superoperator to describe what the dipole dipole relaxation does to the spin system. And I'm going to write it down first of all in a, in a limit, and then we can make it a bit more general later. So, I'm going to write it down in what's called the fast motion limit first. And that fast motion limit is that the lower more frequency multiplied by the correlation time is a small number. In that case, the dipole dipole relaxation superoperator, and I'm not going to go into the theory of how it's derived. But it's given by, it's negative uh, because it's going to refer to decays. It's proportional to the square of the dipole dipole coupling constant multiplied by some constant here, which comes in when you do the derivation. The correlation time. and then some commutation superoperators. And I'm going to have to talk about this stuff here which is going to come into the theory. So well, it's quite a short equation, actually, but it contains a few terms which require explanation. So we've talked about the dipole-dipole coupling constants. It's just the proportional to the inverse cube of the distance. The next thing to talk about is the correlation time. I want to say something about what that is and what it means. And then there are these quantities here, which are commutation superoperators of particular operators, which are called spherical tensor operators. And that also requires some explanation. So let's uh, look first about the correlation time and ask what that is. Now, a molecule, well, and it's randomly tumbling in solution. Imagine that we could attach a vector to this, some point on the molecule and between the, a point on the surface of the molecule, whatever that should mean, and um, the center of mass. And then we describe the direction of that vector using polar angles. So we'd have theta and phi are polar angles. This describes the orientation of the molecule in space. Now there are mathematical functions called spherical harmonics. And these are orthogonal mathematical functions which are functions of polar angles. So they're, they're defined, usually denoted by the symbol L and there's a whole set of them with subscripts L, M. L is called the rank 
which can be 0, 1, 2. And then for each rank, one has a bunch of components where m goes from minus l up to plus l in steps of 1. So there are actually 2l plus 1 values of m for each rank l. And these spherical harmonics are very familiar to chemists as the the angular parts of the orbitals. So, uh, somewhat loosely speaking, the rank zero spherical harmonic looks like a sphere or like an s orbital. And then one has three rank one spherical harmonics which have the spatial form of p orbitals. in the three different directions. And we have five rank two spherical harmonics, which have the spatial form of d orbitals. But these are just mathematical functions, often quite complicated functions of these uh, polar angles theta and phi. Now, suppose we're, we somehow track a single molecule and we're tracking the, um, the values of theta and phi in time. They will be randomly varying because of the tumbling motion of the molecule. At each point in time, we, we know what the value of theta and phi is, so we could plot um, a particular spherical harmonic as a function of time. And it would be some fluctuating function due to the tumbling motion of the molecule. And from that we could derive what's called correlation function, which um, determines the time scale of these fluctuations. So what is a correlation function? It goes something like this, that if we have some randomly fluctuating variable, I suppose it's varying in time, and let's just say it's a function f of t, something which depends on time like this. And then we take its value at some particular time point t and then we also take its value at some particular time point t plus a small time tau and we multiply those two things together and then we average that for all different time points But we keep for each time point, so in, in other words, we, we take lots of pairs of time points, basically, at a particular time t, but also a later time, t plus tau. And then we just repeat that for lots of values of t. We multiply them together and average over all t. And that's called correlation function. <clears throat> so that would now depend on the the interval between these time points. Now, in many cases, this correlation function will not depend on t. It shouldn't depend on which time point we actually choose. And we're averaging over everything. It shouldn't change in time. That's called a stationary process. A stationary process doesn't depend on time. This is a way of saying that something is time independent even though it depends on time which is a bit of a crazy thing to say but maybe you get the point it sort of looks the same everywhere in time it's not like sometimes you have big fluctuations and sometimes you have small fluctuations the sort of general size and shape of the fluctuation should always be the same at all points in time 
Um, and in that case, we have what's called a stationary process. Now, if you think about this correlation function, the point here is that if the two time points here, the, uh, the black one and the blue one, are always very close to each other, then these two values will always be very similar. So then this average will be a large. So we have g of t in general decays with time. Because when the interval between the two time points is small, the two time points will always be similar. But you can imagine maybe, so this delayed tau here, uh, if we imagine our fluctuating process here, that we always take two time points which are very close together in time, then there's not enough time for the process to say change sign between the time points. So if it's, maybe if we take a, take an expanded view of that, that the, we're always taking pairs of time points where if this is positive, this would also be positive. Similarly, here the other time point is close enough that this is also going to be of the same sign. This is negative, this is also negative. Take the product, it's still positive. So we get a large value of the correlation function here. But if we uh, move the gap between the time points, so we're comparing two time points with a large time gap between them, then sometimes they may have the same sign, but sometimes they're going to end up with different signs. And as a result, the correlation time, when one takes the average overall time, goes, uh, becomes a small value. So the correlation function gives a measure of how fast the fluctuations are. And the correlation time is just a measure of how fast that correlation function decays. The time scale for the decay of the correlation time is, of the correlation function is the correlation time. In fact, uh, one often makes an assumption, which is another of those things which is a bit not to justify on, on physical grounds, but one makes an assumption that this is just an exponential decay, which looks like that. So that's just a, an assumption which sometimes has good validity, but other times is, is less valid. Correlation functions can be very complicated things. But in this assumption, we just assume that the correlation function is an exponential decay function, which goes uh, from a large value to zero. And then it's the correlation time is the decay in that, the decay time constant of the correlation function. So that's, that's the general principles of correlation functions and correlation times, the way of of quantifying how rapid the fluctuations are of a particular random variable. Now if we go back to our spherical harmonics, so if you remember then, so the molecule is rotating, we describe the orientation of the molecule by polar angles. For each orientation of the molecule we could calculate the value of a particular spherical harmonic And actually, each of these now fluctuates in time because of the rotation of the molecule. And each of them, in general, has a different correlation time. So if we imagine the rotation of the molecule, again, so we have the molecule, we have its angular variables, which define the orientation. We could then plot the value of all the spherical harmonics in time. They all depend on these angular variables. And how do they change in time? Well, y0, 0, zero that's just like an s orbital. That doesn't change in time at all, because if you rotate a sphere, 
it looks the same. So that's a bit weird. That, so that, that one behaves in a different way from the others, really. But all the others will fluctuate in time at, uh, in general, different rates from each other. And so on. So in fact, each of these has, each of the spherical harmonics has its own correlation time, which one could compute by calculating the correlation function and then uh, figuring out its decay. So we have correlation times t0, 0, t1, 0, t1 plus 1, etc. Tau 2, 0, and so on. So in general, a molecule rotating has lots of correlation times. And this is even just a rigid molecule rotating in solution. However, again, we put in some assumptions and a physical model. The physical model, which is usually used for rotation of molecules in solution, is called rotational diffusion. And that's uh, something that you've heard about in the accompanying lectures by art. The rotational diffusional model actually leads to a couple of different things. Uh, actually, we're also going to call this the isotropic rotational diffusion model, meaning it's the same in all directions of space. It leads to a few things. One is that the, the correlation times for the different L, uh, the different M values belonging to the same L value are all the same. So there's no M dependence. Nevertheless, the correlation times for different L values are different from each other, actually. The correlation time for rank L is proportional to 1 over 2L plus 1. In other words, what the way this works is then is that the, the correlation time for rank 2 is shorter than the correlation time for rank 1, and so on which is more or less what I've sketched here. So I've made the fluctuations of the rank two terms faster than the fluctuation of the rank one term. Now it turns out for dipole-dipole relaxation, however, uh, what actually counts is the correlation time for rank two. There are other interactions where it's the correlation time for rank one which counts. So dipole-dipole relaxation involves tau 2, the correlation time for rank 2 spherical harmonics. And actually that situation is so common in NMR theory that very often one just calls this tau C. And 99% 99 times out of 100, if you see tau c in an NMR paper for the correlation time of a molecule, what it means is the correlation time for rank 2 spherical harmonics. But one has to be a bit careful because there are some interactions which are not rank 2 and their correlation time is different. And just occasionally that actually comes in, but we're not going to deal with that today. So after all of that we finally get down to what the correlation time means. So for a rotating tumbling molecule in the rotational diffusion model we use in the dipole-dipole relaxation superoperator correlation time tau c which technically is the correlation time for rank 2 spherical harmonics the d orbital like functions. So having said that we can then form the dipole-dipole relaxation superoperator and again I write it down again in extreme narrowing or very fast motion which means that the Larmor frequency multiplied by tau c, where tau c is here the 
rank two correlation time. Well, this correlation time is much less than one and is given by, after some theory, one gets this expression minus six over five B J K squared tau C, again, the rank two correlation time. And then a sum over rank two spin operators converted into commutation superoperators. Now this expression involves spherical tensor operators and they work uh, very much like again like atomic orbitals. So just as one can have functions, spherical harmonics, which have a convenient rotational properties, s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, one can also define operators which have convenient rotational properties. And those are called spherical tensor operators. And spin dynamica includes implementations of these spherical tensor operators. So just like for uh, the atomic orbitals and the spherical harmonics with p orbitals, d orbitals, and so on, uh, described by objects with rank 0, 1, and 2, so one also has sets of spherical harmonics t2 minus 2, t2 minus 1, t2 0, t2 1, t2 2. So for rank 2, which is important for the dipole-dipole coupling, uh, we have five spherical tensor operators. So what's happening here is that we're in, we have to define the rotation of the molecule in space and that's done for dipole-dipole coupling by rank two spherical harmonics and that's why the correlation time belongs to the rank two spherical harmonics and at the same time we have the, the operators which describe the, the interaction between the spins in terms of operators which have convenient rotational properties and these are the spherical tensor operators. So if we, for example, set up a, a system with two spins, two spins a half, we can ask spin dynamica for the spherical tensor operator involving the coupling between the two spins, one and two, and we can ask for a particular spherical tensor operator, so rank two component zero, for example. And that's given by this complicated looking operator. Uh, we can ask for the rank two M is one component. And we get another operator, which also has a complicated form and so on. We could also ask it for a rank one operator. It looks very similar actually to the rank two operator, but in fact it has a very different rotational property. So spin dynamica knows the spherical tensor operators for any um, set of spin interactions If we want the rank three spherical tensor operator for three coupled spins, then we can derive that. Now, such operators are not very commonly used in NMR theory, but they're there if we ever need them. So dipole-dipole coupling, we're going to use rank two spherical tensor operators. So in this fast motion limit, we can simply use this expression you can see we have a sum of the of all five uh, of commutation superoperator products for all five spherical tensor operators of rank two. 
So we go back to a two spin system. And here I've simply written in the expression in spin dynamical language for the apple dapple relaxation superoperator in extreme narrowing, fast motion limit. Uh, we have the square of the dipole dipole coupling constant here has just been left symbolic as, as B. The rank 2 correlation time tau C. The sum over all five um, spherical tensor operators with n going from minus 2 to plus 2. The double commutation superoperator, which is the way of doing these products of two commutators. The spherical tensor operator for the coupling between spin 1 and spin 2, rank 2 component m. And just add them all together and I get the relaxation superoperator. And it's an ex a long expression because of the sum of those five terms. But we don't have to worry about it too much. Spin Dynamica knows what to do with it. And here, for example, I'm just using it in a calculation. So what calculation is involved here? So I use the trajectory routine here. And when you use trajectory, you start with a density operator and you track one or more operators. So here I'm starting with I1Z. So this is a loose way of specifying a state with Z polarization of spins of type 1. And I'm going to track what happens to I1Z and I2Z. So in an experiment, one could imagine that one has a two-spin system. Suppose one, for example, saturates the magnetization of one of the sides using an RF field, and then one's left with Z magnetization on the other, on the side of spin one. And now we let the system evolve and look and see what happens to the magnetization on spin one and the magnetization on spin two. We track this for a duration of 10 seconds in this case. In the presence of, we specify a background generator, so this is going to work all the time, of this dipole-dipole relaxation superoperator. And here I've given it some numerical values to work with. So I, I've specified that the dipole-dipole coupling constant should be equal to the, the coupling between two protons, that's the one here, separated by distance of two angstroms, which is a sort of typical distance in a molecule. So the direct dipolar coupling routine here knows how to calculate uh, couplings between pairs of spins of any isotopic type at any given distance. So the direct dipole coupling routine, if you give it a list of two isotope specifications, then it does that. But if you just give it one, then it assumes you mean two of the same type. So that's a useful routine. So, so this just immediately gives you this B number for protons, in this case, separated by two angstroms. Now I've used here a correlation time of 100 picoseconds, so this would be appropriate for a small molecule in solution. So let's see what happens. So I calculated the trajectory and now we plot it. And what do we see? We see the, so the Z magnetization of spin number one is the black line here. So that started at 1 because that was the initial condition here. And then it decays because of the dipole-dipole relaxation. 
But what we see is that the magnetization of spin 2, which started at zero because there was no polarization there in the initial condition, this increases, but actually in the negative sense. So the, little surprisingly maybe, mm -hmm. the magnetization of spin 1 feeds the magnetization of spin 2, but pushes it negative. And this is the nuclear overhauser effect which is negative for small molecules. In fact, uh, we can examine what's happening there analytically if we want. So I suppose we wanted to know what was the cross relaxation rate constant given by this complicated looking relaxation superoperator we can do that in a very simple way by taking the Liouville bracket of one operator, I1z, with the relaxation superoperator and the operator I2z. Make sure we normalize the operators and simply calculate that. And it gives us an analytical formula for the cross relaxation rate constant for the dipole dipole coupling and the correlation time so what we're we're essentially forming here is like a little kinetic matrix in which we have i1z and i2z It's just a little kinetic matrix of two by two. And one of these elements, say this one here, is called the cross relaxation rate constant. This says how fast does the Z-magnetization for one spin feed into the magnetization of the other? And this can be calculated using the Liouville bracket between the relevant operators and the relaxation superoperator with some normalization. and that's handled by the Leoville bracket routine in spin dynamica. So one doesn't have to always use the superoperators for numerical calculations, one can use them also to do analytical estimations and often derive analytical results which otherwise are accessible with some labor that's what happens when you have dipole-dipole relaxation um, in the limit of short correlation time, which is appropriate for small molecules. But to handle a biomolecular NMR, we have to be a bit more general than that. We can't use the limit of short correlation time all the time. So we move on now to the general correlation time case. Uh, just to get this neat, I've cleared some previous definitions because I don't want those to conflict with calculation coming up now. And here, an a very important function here is the spectral density function. This is, technically speaking, a Fourier transform of the correlation function. So rather than going into too many details, I'll just use this as a a programmed function. So one simply has a function of the correlation time, so the spectral density, we call it J omega, is given by the correlation time divided by 1 plus the frequency squared correlation time squared. So the way this works basically is we have a fluctuating process. We form from that process its correlation function. 
skipping some theoretical steps here, but this is what it amounts to, is one takes the Fourier transform of that to turn that into a function of frequency. And that has this form, like this. And this is the spectral density function. And the way it works is the if the correlation function is, uh, if the fluctuations are slow, we get a more slowly decaying correlation function. When you have a slow decay, that Fourier transforms into something with a, a narrow line. So then we get a sharp correlation function. And to take into account the a finite correlation time of non-molecules rotating in solution. One uses a form of the dipole-dipole relaxation superoperator for general correlation times. It has a very similar form to um, in the fast motion limit. So again we have the square of the dipole-dipole coupling and since the dipole-dipole coupling is proportional to the inverse cube of the distance, this is proportional to the inverse sick power of the distance between the two spins. And we have the sum of the second rank terms. So again, a sum going between minus two and plus two for the to cover the five spherical tensor operators of rank two. So we have again the commutation superoperators of the second rank spherical tensor operators. But we have a new thing which comes in for a general correlation time is that we need a spectral density function. At multiples of the Larmor frequency. So this would be the case of homonuclear dipole-dipole relaxation. The heteronuclear case is a little bit more complicated. Anyway, so that's it. That's the dipole-dipole relaxation superoperator and we can now explore what it does. So here it is um, um, programmed in for a general correlation time. This is the spectral density function. Um, so again, the spectral density function for a given correlation time with the assumption of an exponential correlation function It's just a simple function of frequency. And the spectral density is then sampled at multiples of the Larmor frequency. M is, strictly speaking, M is minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two for the five terms in the sum. So let's just see what it does. So here again, I'm simulating the trajectory for a density operator for spins one polarized along the z-axis, but no z-magnetization for spin two to start with. And we track what happens for the z-magnetizations for the two types of spins. In the presence of dipole-dipole relaxation, correlation time of 100 picoseconds, dipole-dipole coupling two protons separated by two angstroms, and now I have to put in the Larmor frequency. So here I've put in 500 megahertz uh, using the negative sign to be rigorous. Um, and we get the same as before because this is now in the fast motional limit. But now we're able to change this correlation time. So here is 100 picoseconds. So let's see, we do the same thing now for a longer correlation time, 300 picoseconds. And 
what you see now is that the um, the cross relaxation, which causes the magnetization of spin number one to feed into the magnetization of spin number two, is much weaker at this longer correlation time. If we increase the correlation time further to 500 picoseconds, then we see actually that the cross relaxation has changed sign. So now the magnetization is feeding in to the second spin in a positive way. And if we go to a case which might be appropriate for a macromolecule of one nanosecond, then we see that actually the cross relaxation is rapid and brings these two magnetizations rapidly into contact with each other and then they then decay together. So those are the effects which are very important in the nosy experiment. Um, so for small molecules, the nosy peaks are negative, as shown here by the blue curve. There's a, a particular region of correlation time where the cross -rela relaxation essentially vanishes. And then for large molecules, the nosy peaks become positive and stronger. In fact, nosy turns out to be an unusual experiment, which is much easier to get good spectra for for large molecules than for small molecules. And as an anecdote, actually the very first attempts to do an experiment of this type were on small molecules and completely failed. And actually the experiment was written off as something of very little interest to anybody until Kumar, who was a postdoc of Kurt Wüthrich at that time, decided in fact against the resistance of other people in the laboratory to use instrument time just to try it on a macromolecule. Being told by everybody that there was no way it was going to work because they'd already tried it on a small molecule and it was just hopeless. You didn't see anything. And of course he returned a famous spectrum of small protein with cross peaks all over the place and that completely changed the field of two-dimensional NMR and won his boss, Vutrich, a Nobel Prize some time later. So nosy is a very unusual, so this cross relaxation with its change in sign, depending on correlation time, is an unusual behavior. Now we can also, if we want, um, look at that cross relaxation analytically, but now for this general case of a, of a general correlation time. And spin dynamica through the Liouville bracket gives the expression for the cross relaxation rate constant and it's easy to solve this to find the, the correlation time at which the cross relaxation rate constant goes to zero, in which the nosy peaks vanish. Now, another experiment in this group of experiments is called ROSI, uh, which means um, cross relaxation in the rotating frame, a name which I'm not a fan of because physical effects are not dependent on the frame in which we observe them. That should be a uh, commonplace, but unfortunately this type of uh, misleading nomenclature has made its way in the field of NMR. What this really means is simply cross relaxation with, an, with a radio frequency field applied. Nothing to do with the framing which one looks at it. So this is cross relaxation of transverse magnetization. Um, and we can simulate that too, it's very straightforward. We simply start with transverse magnetization I1x, and again now track the trajectories of I1x and I2x. Uh, now the event in which I've chosen to track this now has an RF field of, in this case, one kilohertz applied along the x-axis. So this is the spin locking field. But again, the same background generator, there's no 
change here. Again, we have dipole dipole relaxation superoperator with a correlation time of 100 picoseconds, and the other parameters being the same. And in the same way as before, we can track the trajectory and we get negative cross relaxation. Very similar to the case when we're cross-relaxing the Z-magnetization. But what happens when we increase the correlation time? The nosy effect changed sign. But we can look at it now, say, go all the way to one nanosecond. And it doesn't change sign, it remains negative. So this is why the rosy experiment is very useful, because it doesn't change sign. It, it works reliably independent of correlation time. And again, we can analyze for the analytical form of the rosy cross relaxation rate constant, and it comes out like this. And whereas the, the nosy uh, expression has terms of opposite sign, which can then uh, cancel each other out under some circumstances. The rosy expression uh, doesn't, so the both terms are the same sign. So the rosy um, effect gives a consistently negative cross-relaxation effect. Now we can also look at uh, another relaxation phenomena. One of them is a problem when we're interested in the behavior of one spin, for example, a spin half. Here I've set up um, a spin system with a single spin half, which here is called I, and a second spin, which here is with spin one. So this could, for example, represent the case of a proton coupled to a nitrogen 14. And I've assumed that the spin Hamiltonian contains a heteronuclear coupling term, the product of the two uh, Z operators. In this case, with a J coupling of 65 hertz. Uh, if I simply um, calculate the spectrum without any relaxation, using a signal 1D routine, then I get um, three peaks because the, the, the spin half nucleus, the proton, is coupled, um, sees the coupling to the spin one nucleus, which has three states with equal populations. So I get a one, one, one triplet in that case. It's important in these simulations um, using signal 1D to indicate which spin in this heteronuclear system is, is being observed. By default, it would observe all spins in the, in the system at the same time. Spin Dynamica doesn't know that you really mean to only observe one of them because it's a heteronuclear system. So you have to tell it by specifying the observable. And now we can start to introduce relaxation of the second spin the S spin, and that's done by including a relaxation superoperator, and that could be a realistic um, relaxation superoperator involving a, a mechanism such as quadrupole relaxation for the second spin. But here, I've just chosen to use a phenomenological relaxation superoperator in which you specify T1 and T2, and the syntax used here simply says for the spin S, uh, give it a T1 and a T2 value both equal to one second. And then we can simulate the spectrum, but here again observing the I spin, not the relaxing one. It has to set a few things up, and it generates a spectrum which one, in this case, one sees that actually the central peak is starting to become a little bit broader. And if we allow the S spin to relax more rapidly, so now with 10 milliseconds for a T1 value, we get a considerable broadening of the I spin spectrum. The triplets are still visible, but now much broader with the 
the central components in this case with this model broader than the outer peaks. And if we continue to increase the relaxation of the coupling partner now to one millisecond, then the coupling structure collapses and we get a single broad peak. But if the relaxation is made more fast, so 100 microseconds now for the relaxation of the coupling partner, then the spectrum narrows up again. And this is a manifestation of a, a phenomenon called self-decoupling, in which a spin is coupled to a second spin, which, because it's relaxing rapidly, decouples itself from the first spin. So the, the J couplings between, from the, in this case, uh, nitrogen 14 and the proton become invisible in the spectrum because of the, the relaxation, the rapid relaxation of nitrogen 14 spin. So that's also a very common phenomenon in NMR where couplings to rapidly relaxing spins cease to be visible in the NMR spectrum. Now another phenomenon we want to look at briefly is what's called cross-correlation. So just to explain that, this occurs when we have two random processes. For example, f of t and g of t. And they're both fluctuating. And one can um, construct the, from the fluctuations of each of these, one can construct its, its own correlation function. So G, let's call it GF of tau, would be a correlation function which decays in time. And similarly, the other function, G, would have a different its own correlation function as well, which decays in time. But what can happen, and what very often does happen, is that the fluctuations in one process are to some extent mirrored in the fluctuations of the second process as well. And this uh, happens often when the two processes have a common physical origin. And in the context of NMR, that's very common when you have fluctuations caused by molecular rotation because, for example, the molecular rotation, the same molecular rotation will modulate two different dipole-dipole couplings at the same time just because they're physically linked, they're of the, part of the same rotating body. So one can have a cross-correlation effect in which one this time takes the average If you remember for the autocorrelation, these G functions, one takes the value of the function at a certain time and its value at a later time, but of the same function, one can also construct what's called a cross-correlation function by multiplying the two different functions together and then averaging over time. And if the functions are correlated, this cross-correlation function will be finite and also decays with its own correlation time. And that's a common phenomenon in NMR and there are numerous situations in which it's experimentally important. In this particular one I, I'm just going to look at a, a situation where we have the two different interactions are a dipole-dipole coupling, in this case a heteronuclear case, and a chemical shift and isotropy, which is another interaction linked to the orientation of a molecule in space. And I've taken some shortcuts in the analysis here, which to be able to do this relatively briefly. So let me just show you how the simulation works. So having loaded spin dynamica and setting up a system, in this case of uh, spin I with a half and spin S with a half, I formed a relaxation superoperator. Now this is approximate but will do the job for us uh, for the time being. So let's just look at the components of this. Uh, I have a spectral density function here, although here I'm only sampling the zero frequency part of it. That's because I'm interested in uh, a limit of slow motion. 
And I have the usual construction with a double commutation superoperator. But here what you notice is that the, the two operators inside the double commutation superoperator, that's one of the operators, it's not a single operator, it's the self sum of two operators. And actually one of these operators belongs to the dipole-dipole coupling, and the other operator belongs to the chemical shift and isotropy. And that's true for the second operator as well. So I have a double commutation superoperator involving two operators, each of which contains two terms. And that's the technically correct way of introducing two mechanisms which have complete correlation. You see, this introduces cross terms in which I have a double commutation superoperator involving this operator, which is dipole dipole coupling, with this operator which is the chemical shift and isotropy, and the other way around, where I have the chemical shift and isotropy and the dipole-dipole coupling. So this is a way of introducing correlation terms in spin dynamica. So we can evalu evaluate that. This would be what this relatively simple uh, superoperator looks like for this uh, cross correlated dipole dipole and chemical shift and isotropy relaxation. And we can simulate um, what the spectrum looks like. So here I've used this uh, relaxation superoperator defined as shown here. I've picked a particular correlation time, in this case 20 nanoseconds. The dipole-dipole coupling constant, I've chosen dipole coupling between proton and nitrogen 15, separated by 1.02 angstroms, which seems to be what's often used for NH groups in a protein. I've also introduced a chemical shift and isotropy for the nitrogen 15, the S spin, of minus 170 ppm. That's a typical value used for, uh, encountered for nitrogen 15 CSAs. Here I've simulated for a magnetic field of 4.7 Tesla, a rather low magnetic field, and um, a gyromagnetic ratio comes into the formula here for the S spin, so that has to be specified as well. So I've just used the gyromagnetic ratio for nitrogen 15. And we just simply simulate the spectrum using the combined generators involving the J coupling between the two spins and this relaxation superoperator. And we get, we get a doublet with one of the doublet peaks much uh, broader than the other one. So that's the typical trozy effect. And we could experiment with that, changing the magnetic field. If we, if we double the magnetic field, one of the peaks gets narrower and the other gets broader. Uh, I believe the optimum field for this type of phenomenon is around 18 Tesla or so. And here we see that one of the peaks is almost completely broadened to nothing while the other has got very narrow. But if we go further, if we go to a higher field, let's say 30 Tesla, which we can do on the computer, but not in reality at the moment, uh, we see that discrepancy starts to come down again. Both peaks start to broaden because they're both experiencing strong CSA effects. But there's not less difference between them. Uh, in fact, we can um, do this analytically as well. So we can use the Liouville bracket construction, but now using operators which belong to the, each transition of the two spin of the two spins. So this operator here, so we have a minus one quantum uh, coherence operator for the S spin, nitrogen 15, but the one which belongs to the alpha state of the proton. 
So the k constant of that, which is relevant to the line width of that transition, the alpha transition, uh, maybe derives this way, and we get a particular analytical expression for it. For the other component, we get a different analytical expression. You can see the signs are different. And for one of them, by changing the magnetic field, you can make this vanish, while for the other one, the two line widths add up together. And one could even use Mathematica to solve for the magnetic field at which one of the line widths vanishes. And that gives you the solution for the, if you know these parameters, the dipole gyromagnetic ratio and the, and the chemical shift in isotropy, this gives you the magnetic field at which the Eutrosi effect is maximal. And you can simply just plot the analytical expressions for those two um, line width factors. And you can see in this case the, the line width goes to zero for one of the uh, peaks at something like 18 tesla, while for the other peak it continues to increase with field. Now as a final uh, topic in uh, this relaxation section, I'll just talk about another interesting relaxation phenomenon, which is that of long-lived states. So here we're going to go back to two protons in a homonuclear system. And I just set up the relaxation superoperator as done before in this case uh, for general correlation time. So this is exactly the same as uh, what was done previously. I've just used a dipole coupling corresponding to two protons separated by two angstroms. Um, at a Larmor frequency of 500 megahertz. So that was the same superoperator that's been used before. And for example, we can plot the trajectories of the Z-magnetization components just as we did before, which shows cross-relaxation using that superoperator at a correlation time of 100 picoseconds. The magnetization of spin 1 decays and feeds in the negative sense to the magnetization of spin 2. We can plot the T1 relaxation simply by using the total Z magnetization of the, of the two spins. That decays with T1. And the T1 is, uh, for this particular relaxation superoperator in this correlation time, 100 picoseconds, is approximately uh, one second. So it would appear possible to keep any magnetization in the spin system for longer than a few seconds, or any spin order in the spin system for longer than a few seconds. And in fact, that was the general understanding in the field until um, about 10, 15 years ago. But it turns out that it's not, there is a way of keeping magnetization in this system or well, technically not magnetization, but a type of spin order for much longer than T1. And that's shown in this simulation. It concerns a different sort of operator, which is I1 dot I2, which is this combination of uh, angular momentum operators, I1x, I2x, plus I1y, I2y, I1z. I2z added together. And this is called singlet order. I'll explain why in a minute, why it's called that. But let's simulate it first. So here I've just calculated it under exactly the same conditions as before, but the trajectory of singlet order. So I've assumed that somehow one prepares an initial density operator which is proportional to this operator and then just tracks what happens to it under the same relaxation superoperator as before, in which T1 is about one second. It doesn't decay at all. So this is what's called a long-lived state. It's a mode of spin order in a two spin and a half system which does not relax under dipole-dipole coupling. And that's something which can be 
derived theoretically and verified experimentally. Um, now, of course, in, in practice it will relax because here the superoperator used in this, for this calculation is very pure. It's just the pure the superoperator just for a pure dipole-dipole relaxation mechanism in which only those two spins are involved. Now in a real molecule there's going to be other coupling spins around, there's going to be chemical shift effects and so on. So there's never going to be just that superoperator. But nevertheless in many cases that is the dominant relaxation mechanism and by constructing uh, this superoperator and maintaining it in place one can essentially defeat spin lattice relaxation. Just to show um, one experimental example of that, this was a recent paper that we published um, last year. In this case, we, uh, with uh, chemistry collaborators, we constructed a molecule which was just in order to make a spectacular demonstration of this. So we're not proposing that this is very useful for any real applications, but just do something cool. So our chemistry friends managed to make this molecule, which is a naphthalene with two fused rings. So they succeeded in putting carbon-13 labels at the junction here. So there's two carbon-13s. And they're the spin-half pair, which we need to make the construct the long lived state. Now we have to uh, what I didn't talk about, and I won't have time in this talk to talk about, is how one uh, gets the spin system to adopt this particular state with described by this uh, rather peculiar density operator described by this combination of operators. And it turns out to do that, one needs to have to get access to that state. It's a bit like having a safe. A safe, a very good safe, might be completely smooth on the outside and whatever is inside the safe could be locked forever. But the problem is you can't get in or out of it. You've got to have a keyhole in which you can insert a key in order to unlock the safe so you can deposit something in the safe. And in this context, the role of the keyhole is provided by a small chemical shift difference between these carbon-13s which is provided by making one of these groups slightly different from the others. And that gives the two carbon-13s a slightly different chemical shift and that enables us with a certain pulse sequence to deposit convert magnetization to this special type of order which is then locked and which we can then use the same chemical shift difference to unlock it and retrieve it afterwards. Uh, of this long-lived singlet order in this, in this case of more than one hour uh, where the T1 in this system was about 10 seconds. So we could demonstrate this extremely long lifetime and we're currently um, and other groups as well developing applications of this idea. Um, let's just see what this means though just before we leave the topic. So. So what is this operator? Now normally we look at these operators in, in the Zeeman basis of states alpha, alpha, beta, alpha and so on. And if we look at that operator in that basis it has a particular matrix representation which looks as follows. It has some off-diagon elements. It's not very obvious what that really means. But there's another way of looking at it, which is to not use this Zeeman basis, but to use a different basis, which is called a singlet-triplet basis, which is built into spin dynamica. That basis has a different set of kets. The first ket in the basis is called the singlet state, and it's given by alpha beta minus beta alpha normalized by square root of 2. And then one has three states which are called parts of the triplet state. That's the usual alpha alpha and the beta beta, but alpha beta plus beta alpha normalized. And this singlet state has a very interesting property. It has total spin of 0. It's not magnetic. 
So this state will never give an NMR signal or be involved in anything to do with an NMR signal. It's not magnetic, it has spin zero. And if you look at the matrix representation of this uh, long-lived operator in the singlet-triplet basis, we see it now looks like this. This is diagonal and it's easy to interpret. You can see that the singlet state has an opposite sign to the three triplet states, which are all equal. So what this operator represents actually is the difference in population between the singlet state and the triplet state. So what we do when we prepare that operator is make the population difference between the uh, very special singlet state of the system and the three triplet states. And in fact, that's, one can show that that helps us understand also why it's long-lived. There are symmetry arguments which one can use in this situation, which demonstrate that without any uh, explicit working. Okay, so I'll close this lecture now, and just to review it then. So I showed how to construct some examples of re realistic relaxation superoperators for particular mechanisms, such as the dipole-dipole relaxation mechanism. And in fact, for all relaxation mechanisms in this Redfield regime, the form of this relaxation superoperator is always pretty much the same, with some variations as to which spherical tensor operators one should be using. So, and the numerical factors depend on the mechanism as well. So the only tricky thing in programming in realistic relaxation superoperators in the spin dynamica is to figure out what the factors should be and which spherical tensor operators to use. In the literature, when one looks in a paper on relaxation, one will find formula for these operators, often in the form of a table. So essentially any relaxation mechanism can be uh, simulated using spin dynamic in, in this uh, Redfield regime. And then cross-correlation, as I showed for the case of Trozzi, can also be included just by uh, taking commutation superoperator not of a single spherical tensor operator, but of some of several spherical tensor operators. Beyond that, there's no difference. So the, the whole mechanism for specifying these things in spin dynamica is relatively uniform. And I showed you that you can generate um, numerical simulations which represent useful spin dynamical effects in magnetic resonance. And it's also straightforward to generate analytical expressions to understand them. So thank you very much.